Catastrophic disclosure is coming despite deep state opposition. A surging moon quake, is it a sign of massive infrastructure projects or fighting on the moon? There's an additional 85 habitable exoplanets that were discovered by a British PhD student. Will the James Webb Space Telescope confirm biosignatures and or technosignatures on any of these? Creation of space arcs and their history on Earth. A witness to the Miami Mall tall aliens incident describes a glitch in the matrix. The historic satellite radar tracking of city-sized UFOs predates 1992 and 1996 cases in South America. And there's a Nordic extraterrestrial assimilation program. These and other stories on Exopolitics Today, the week in review. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here is Dr. Michael Sala. Well, welcome to the Week in Review for Exopolitics Today. It is February 3rd. And today actually is the day I am doing my first webinar for 2024. And that's going to be covering what is going to happen this year. And we have a trailer. And that trailer, uh, this is the first Twitter story that I'm uh, covering today. And that trailer is titled Catastrophic Disclosure is Coming Despite Deep State Opposition. And it really is about catastrophic disclosure. What is it? What are the principal players or institutions involved in it? And, and why is it going to happen? Why isn't there going to be a, a kind of more controlled, graduated disclosure project? Well, you know, watch the trailer. You get an idea of it. And if this is a topic that interests you, because I think this is going to be really a big year. I think everything is lining up for this being a, a major year of disclosure, simply because uh, the efforts to manipulate and manage public perceptions over the UFO topic, uh, that there is a kind of... Uh, struggle between different factions they can't re resolve their differences and so i think uh, we're going to have a kind of catastrophic disclosure whereby both the pro and anti-disclosure crowds kind of like neutralize themselves and so we then have some pretty important disclosures about extraterrestrial life and uh, biological entities visiting and interacting with our world. So that's the trailer, and you could uh, register, still time to register for the webinar, which will be held later today at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 11 a.m. Uh, West Coast Pacific Time. Now, here's a interesting story. There was a surge in moonquakes. Uh, ostensibly due to the cooling of the moon's molten core. Now, this is a story that was covered in the debrief, and it goes over the latest uh, scientific geological data from the moon, and it speculates that this phenomenon, these moonquakes, are coming from the volcanic core or the molten core of the moon cooling, that the moon is like a miniature earth in the sense that you have a, a molten core and as it, as the kind of molten core uh, cools or expands or contracts, you have moonquakes or earthquakes uh, as we have on earth. Now, the problem though with this theory is that, you know, going back to the 1970s when the Russians uh, began to do various experiments on the moon where they found that the moon behaved like a bell, like a hollow bell. Uh, they, they crashed some of their uh, lunar probes on the moon and then NASA followed suit and, they, and confirmed pretty much the same thing. So the Soviet scientists uh, first came out with theories that the moon was hollow. And, not, and then eventually you have all of these 
stories coming out about these giant caverns in the moon and it kind of matches with some of the ancient historical data about the moon uh, being a, a relatively new um, phenomenon in our solar system. So uh, th th leads to a couple of theories. Uh, are, are there underground uh, bases being built? Uh, are there giant uh, infrastructure projects underway on the moon? Or could there be fights? Uh, could there be battles between different factions of secret space programs or ET groups? So this is uh, a really interesting uh, phenomenon to follow because uh, often uh, these moon quakes or Mars quakes, earthquakes on our, on our planet, uh, they might not be caused by seismic activity at all, but because of things happening in the underground uh, which are being covered up. So definitely worth following uh, that story. Okay, this one was uh, very interesting. A, a, a British PhD student has found an additional 85 habitable exoplanets using NASA data. So uh, there's, a, there's a process they do with uh, the confirmation of exoplanets. You know, first you have the detection, and, and they're kind of like called candidate exoplanets, and then they wait for another set of data to confirm that they were genuine planets transiting a star, as opposed to some some glitch, a comet, or some other uh, phenomenon. And so once this is confirmed, that'll bring the total number of uh, confirmed exoplanets to 5,500. Now, this is a story that uh, was covered in uh, Earth.com. And so here you have uh, a description of the different planetary systems and uh, how they were able to measure uh, the transit of these planets and uh, the, the research on ex exoplanets and where it's going. And you know, the discovery, the confirmation of exoplanets is quite an important development for a lot of mainstream scientists because, believe it or not, prior to the 1990s, if you ask the scientists, well, are there planets in other solar systems, uh, they would have said, well, we can only speculate. There's no scientific data about that. And, I mean, that seems very odd that you would need to speculate on something that would appear to be such a common sense uh, assumption to make that there are billions of stars and, of course, other solar systems would, would have uh, or suns would have planets like ours. But uh, for many scientists who really are rigorous uh, in terms of sticking to the facts and evidence and empirical data, uh, that was just an ungrounded assumption. You couldn't assume that out of all of the billions of star system or stars out there that any were like the earth in terms of uh, multiple planets and some of those planets being habitable that was you know, crazy to believe that that was the belief system at the at the time well now with the discovery of exoplanets now scientists uh, do admit to this phenomenon of these habitable worlds where these exoplanets, if they're in what's called the Goldilocks region, then that would be uh, optimal for there being life on that planet similar to the Earth. Now, you know, th th there's a big assumption right there because what do you, what do you say about, well, uh, doesn't the Earth have a lot of underground life? Uh, you know, if you go beneath the an Antarctica, for example, under the two, three miles of ice. There's lots of life down there under these uh, these huge cavern systems that um, warmed uh, through the uh, volcanic activity, uh, thermal activity down there. Uh, similarly, you can go to the bottom of the oceans. Uh, the oceans have life uh, at the bottom of those. Um, and, and so uh, you, you can go to uh, frozen lakes, like uh, uh, Lake uh, Vostok, under three miles of ice in Antarctica, you'll find life there. So, so it's a big assumption to say that well, a planet has to have uh, has to be in the Goldilocks uh, system because that's where the Earth is. And in terms of you know, we we can generalize 
that, well, life is going to be similar to the earth. Well, you know, well, what if you have life uh, in underground caverns or at the bottom of the oceans? Um, and they, they could be way outside of the Goldilocks region. So so this this number of habitable planets uh, is, is just a very, very conservative uh, description. Now, the, the, the key, though, is that I covered in the last week in review a story in Britain's Spectator concerning the James Webb Space Telescope stu- will soon start confirming the detection of bio and techno signatures on habitable exoplanets. So this addition of 85 exoplanets just gives the James Webb Space Telescope an additional 85 targets to focus on to see if there are uh, biosignatures on any of these. And I, I think we are not far away from an announcement very soon that biosignatures detected uh, last year, I believe it was in September of last year, there were biosignatures detected on an exoplanet, uh, but the NASA scientists said that uh, we need to confirm the data before any kind of an announcement. And so uh, in the spectator uh, article, they were saying that uh, they already uh, know the answer to to the question of whether or not these biosignatures are confirmed and you can expect a peer-reviewed paper in something like science or, or, or nature very, very soon. So very soon we're going to have an announcement about uh, biosignatures being detected and, and, and so the race is on to find more biosignatures on other exoplanets and eventually techno signatures. Well, here's an interview I did with uh, Leonard Denan on the creation of space arcs and their history on Earth. Now, uh, Elena is a contactee. She has ha- she has had face-to-face contacts with a number of different extraterrestrial uh, entities, and they belong to different organizations. The ones that she's interacted with are the Galactic Federation of Worlds, the, the Council of Five, or I think it's now called the Council of Seven, and uh, the Cedars, or the Intergalactic Confederation. And she's also interacted with the Ashtar Command. So, you know, quite a few different extraterrestrial organizations out there that she has interacted with. And so she shared uh, two updates on Monday of, of this week on the two of the sources that talked about the history of space arcs and their essential uh, functions. So the first update was from uh, an ambassador uh, for the Galactic Federation of Worlds called Akvaru. And he is the ambassador to the Alcyon star system where there is a breakaway Tal or Tal uh, group of Nordic extraterrestrials. And it's very important to keep in mind that not all Nordic extraterrestrials are part of the Galactic Federation or what we would consider to be positive uh, uh, human-looking factions. Some uh, human-looking factions actually belong to the Sakaar or the Reptilian Draco Alliance and the Orion Alliance. And previously, Akvaru, uh, he bro- he actually rebelled from his world because they had allied themselves with the Draconians. So one cannot assume that just because a, a being is human-looking that they're going to be part of the Galactic Federation and therefore positive. Some of them have uh, uh, very questionable agendas because they belong to a negative faction. And uh, Akvaru broke away and now apparently, according to this update, uh, his world is breaking away from the Draconians and realigning with the Galactic Federation. And he had some very interesting things to say about space arcs saying that these are uh, very large, massive ships that are used for obvious evacuation purposes uh, in the case of any contingency. And and that makes sense from the perspective of civilizations that survived 
planetary catastrophes themselves. So the Pleiadians, it's important to remember, are former Lyran refugees, that they were from the Lyran star system and that underwent cataclysmic changes or attacks, if you like, from the Draconians. And so uh, many of the Lyran civilizations had to flee in very large colony ships or what we would consider to be space arcs. So it's understandable why that would be uh, an important requirement in their genetic uh, heritage to have uh, to be able to build space arcs and to have lots of them in case there is ever a need for a planetary evacuation at, at short notice. And so that's what uh, the Galactic Federation does. It does have a number of space arcs that it builds uh, for purposes such as uh, in case there is a need to evacuate very large numbers of people in a short amount of time. The, the, the second update was from Una, a representative of the Altean civilization that is part of the Intergalactic Confederation. So this is an a, a association or an organization that comes from outside of our Milky Way system. And uh, Una is part of the Alteans. And they also build space arcs, but they build the space arcs for slightly different reasons, or actually significantly different reasons to the Galactic Federation. Uh, they build the space arcs because they want to use space arcs to fulfill two important functions. One is uh, to act as a kind of technological seed or seeding bank for the construction of a new civilization. And so uh, with the Alteans, they, they, they actually provided a space arc for the building of the, uh, for the uh, Atlantean civilization. And so that space arc provides advanced technologies, uh, the kind of uh, frequencies emitted by that space arc are used to kind of like orient that civilization in a certain way, uh, so that it evolves in a particular di direction. And so she spoke about that, the history of space arcs. Uh, she spoke about how these space arcs are uh, uh, operated by crews with, with a unique set of uh, genetics and consciousness. And the important thing is that she says that only crew members can operate these space arcs. And... And so this is very important that the space arcs cannot simply be co-opted by other civilizations or other beings, only crew members, only those with the right genetics and the right consciousness are able to activate those space arcs because they were built specifically for different uh, entities uh, whose genetics and consciousness match. Now, the, the thing to keep in mind here is that this is not uh, something that uh, evaporates or, or disappears because someone has died or the crew members die. Uh, the, the crew members can incarnate on a planet. And, and I've spoken about this in the past where the crew members actually can have a hibernation uh, chamber. And so they can hibernate in their hibernation chamber their soul incarnates on the earth, lives a normal earth life and um, ages and then can die and then goes back up to, up to the ark into the hibernation chamber and then can do the whole thing until the time is right for the ark to activate and the crew to uh, fly the arcs again. So she talks about that and also, of course, that the arcs have that second function of being able to evacuate large numbers of people uh, if necessary, especially during times of cataclysm. And, and she points out in, um, and, and, and in the interview I did with Elena, she points out that the time has, has passed where there was a danger to the earth, that our planetary civilization is going to continue rather than implode, which is a great thing. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be uh, certain convulsions or certain um, global uh, 
crises or catastrophes happening in certain regions, uh, but that by and large our planetary civilization is going to continue and there's not going to be a need for the space arcs to pr uh, provide that sec second function of evacuating large numbers of people, uh, that their function is going to be one of providing technology to get us as a civilization to move from, uh, if we use the uh, Kardashev scale of uh, uh, civilizations, you have type 1, type 2, type 3. Uh, our civilization is like a, a type 0 0.7, but in the covert world, you know, it's, it's a, a, say a, a 1.5 or something, but that's a small number of people, several million in the covert uh, world of you know, using all these suppressed anti-gravity and holographic healing technologies and so forth. So that once the arcs manifest or uh, reappear and they surface, they're going to be seen, then this is when the technology is going to be shared. And I, I thought it was really interesting that she said that because uh, that corroborated what JP, uh, the US Army insider that I've been working with since 2008, he said the same thing a, a couple of years ago. So it's great to have that kind of confirmation uh, from UNA, from the Altians and the Intergalactic Confederation, that the space arcs will arise, will appear, when that will happen, uh, that, of course, is the $64,000 question. But I think there are going to be uh, key events that trigger that, that this is um, a sequence of events are going to lead up to that. And I think we're kind of like watching that now happen. And, and you know, for those of you that do my webinar later today, I'll be going deeper into events that are unfolding now, planetary events. Because right now, February 3rd, things are kind of like at a kind of like a, a stage where something major is going to happen to escalate things because we, we watched what happened in Ukraine, that it was about to break, you know, a major war but didn't. Uh, the Israel-Palestine um, conflict uh, also appeared to be on the verge of breaking out into a major war. It hasn't. So something else is going to happen. And so I'm going to be talking about that. All right. Well, I think uh, the Space Arcs story, I think, is very important. And I'm, I'm glad we got these updates from Una and uh, Akvaru about what's going on with space arcs and their history, their, their creation, and their functions. Okay, so here's a tweet from Timothy Burchette. And Timothy Burchette is a congressman from uh, Tennessee, and he talks about disinformation in ufology. So let's see if we could play that for you. There's some of them that are doing it that are, in my opinion, are don't know they're doing it. They're the most effective ones. They've been given false information and and they've got a huge following and and they're they're a fraud. Who are you talking about? I'm not gonna say. I think you and I both know who you're talking about. Yeah, I got my suspicions and the trick. Okay, so there you have Timothy Burchette, a uh, congressman who uh, sits, uh, who is part of the UAP caucus, uh, who uh, was a, a kind of major mover and shaker of, of getting the uh, UFO hearings in Congress and has been quite vocal in being critical of the, of the government cover-up, saying that there is a lot of disinformation in ufology and he doesn't say who it is that's doing it, but saying that some of these people ha have huge followings. So this is very interesting. I mean, he does, he's not willing to name uh, uh, the people that he thinks are, are doing this, uh, that are putting out disinformation. But uh, I, I could probably guess, take a guess myself as to who's doing it, and 
I mean, who he thinks is is putting out disinformation in ufology. And, I mean, this to me is a sign that there is a, a kind of uh, UFO mafia that is forming, which is a conjunct or combination of US members of Congress along with uh, members of academia and some kind of like... Uh, UFO researchers that are involved in these hearings, in these UFO hearings, that they have formed like a little group that are acting like gatekeepers. And if and if you're inside of that group, then that's great. You're going to get uh, a lot of mainstream media attention. You're, you're going to get a lot of uh, support from other members. You know, academic uh, figures are going to kind of like cite you and vice versa. And if you're outside of that little kind of like UFO mafia that is forming, and, you know, I mean, I think Congressman Tim Bushett, I think he means well, but I think he's part of this congressional uh, uh, academia uh, mafia that is forming now to kind of like act as gatekeepers to what to what is disinformation and what is it, what is it disinformation? So I, th I think it would be good for him to actually say who he thinks is putting out this information in the field. I mean, is this are these people part of a psyop, or are these people that uh, bring in a lot more information that Burchett and academics and some of this this kind of like this small group of people associated with, uh, say, David Grush and um, say the Navy pilots are willing to put out, you know, because, you know, I mean, there is a limited hangout that's being put here that, and I think the, and I've spoken about this in the past, that people like David Grush, they're putting out uh, the limited hangout that uh, UFO craft have been recovered. Uh, they are sitting in corporate and military classified facilities and they're being studied for reverse engineering pro uh, uh, prospects. But there has been no success so far. So that's a lie. I mean, but I, I don't doubt that that's the information uh, that Grush and others have been getting because one of the people that I thought really understood this phenomenon uh, at a very deep level was Richard Hoagland. And, of course, he's very famous for putting out books on the face on Mars and, and, and dark mission concerning NASA. But he said that the lie is different at every level. The lie is different at every level. So these people that are part of that UFO mafia that I mentioned, whether, you know, whether we're talking about Tim Burchett, David Grush, Jeremy Corbell, George Knapp, that group that have kind of like uh, part of this coterie of people, we could throw in others like RV Loeb, um, people who would be limiting the UFO information to sources that they find credible, but those sources all say, well, don't talk about the successful reverse engineering projects that people like uh, Stephen Greer, myself and others have been talking about for several decades now that these downed UFO craft have been successfully reverse engineered and craft have been built. And so we've been talking about this for decades, but now you have this new groups coming along, this UFO mafia acting as gatekeepers, getting a lot of mainstream media attention, uh, monopolizing the, the, the kind of like uh, the airways, uh, saying that no, no, these craft have not been successfully reverse engineered. Uh, they're, they're locked up in corporate projects, and they, they can't be. Um, uh, there's there's been no success, no breakthroughs yet because the science is too advanced. So that's that's a limited hangout. Okay, so okay, so that's an announcement for the webinar later today. Okay, so here's a story about a witness to the Miami Mall incident. Now, this witness to the Miami Mall incident uh, says uh, that he was there uh, with 
some family members uh, when he and his family members saw three very tall, like nine foot, ten foot tall beings that were like aliens. And he says that he and his family and others kind of like just fled. They got they got scared and they just kind of ran away. And he said that as they were fleeing, police were stopping people and saying that anyone take photos or video of what happened in there and, you know, people people's uh, uh, phones, smartphones were all searched. Uh, the, the, inst the thing that really kind of got my attention about this interview this interview so let me just play it i'll, I'll talk over it Miami as was interesting as it is playing so here's here's the video and here's the the witness okay so the witness is talking here about what he saw with his family members but one thing that he said that kind of got my attention he said that he was he saw the three tall nine foot beings and he said it was like while he was watching them, there was a glitch, like a glitch in the matrix. So to me, that was like a sign that someone is using holographic technology. So that immediately takes us to the idea of Project Bluebeam because this is what Project Bluebeam was focused on, that it would use holographic technology to simulate some kind of alien event that would scare or awe people in ways that could be manipulated. So this is what's happening in Miami. We watched similar, and this was, of course, uh, January 1st, uh, New Year's Day in Miami. And similar events happened in Peru and uh, earlier, or well, in the middle of 2023. And so I think that we are probably going to witness more of these as, as this is influencing the public very, very quickly in terms of aliens living amongst us. So let me, I'll, I'll explain why I say that very, very shortly. Okay, so here we have a, a story about satellite radar tracking of city-sized UFOs in Earth orbit. And uh, these predate, these go back to 1992 and 1996. So here's a story, and uh, in this story, what, what's described are two city-sized UFOs that are several hundred kilometres in diameter that were spotted above the Earth using conventional technology uh, to photograph these and, uh, and using a GOE S8 weather satellite, so or the yeah goes eight weather satellite in 1992 and 1996 that they photographed these very large motherships above the Earth. So that was 1992 1996, and prior to that, uh, you you did have reports going all the way back to 1955. Uh, Major Donald Kehoe described very large objects that had been spotted by astronomers in Earth orbit. So that was in 55. He wrote the book where he talked about the data. So that data, I think it was 1953, 1954, where um, astronomers using advanced radar or advanced uh, telescopes of that era, and this is before the first satellite. I mean, Sputnik was the first satellite in 1957, but that was tiny. So here you have these giant motherships in Earth orbit in the kind of early 1950s. Uh, so there's a, a long history of motherships or very large flying saucer craft, city-sized craft um, in Earth orbit, and that has been covered up for a long time. So that is a story that I cover. I, 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 that is something well worth uh, watching that YouTube video. It only goes for about three minutes, but I think it gives you historical foundation for understanding the appearance of city-sized motherships is not new, that, that's, that they've been monitored and tracked going all the way back to the 1950s. And I think that sets the stage for some 
pretty major things happening uh, later this year because I, I think that the phenomenon of city-sized motherships, space arcs, is not going to be a subject of speculation for too much longer. And once these start appearing where the people see see these things, uh, you know, this is going to be catastrophic disclosure because it'll people will see these things and realize that they've been lied to for decades. So it's going to be an exciting time, but also a very disturbing time. And I think this is part of the reason why we are in the midst of a lot of uh, tumultuous global events because the, the elite do not want this to happen. They want to distract us from these city-sized motherships appearing who which belong to these benevolent galactic organizations here to help us uh, move to the next level in our evolution or to space arcs that are going to perform that technological seeding function that uh, they uh, have the uh, capacity to do, that the elite do not want this because that will end their monopoly of power and, of course, erode their uh, authority and legitimacy. Okay, so here's uh, something that uh, was uh, released uh, from Elena uh, Denar. Um, and this concerns... Uh, impersonations of Thorhan or impersonations of uh, some of the other figures that she has worked with, some of the different extraterrestrial uh, beings that she has worked with, that there are, are those that are impersonating uh, extra, extraterrestrial sources. So, you know, this is unfortunately uh, just part of the way things happen, and you've got to be discerning. I mean, uh, that happens to myself. It happens to anyone else who has a large social media following. You have impersonators. You have hoaxes. There are a lot of false Michael Salas out there that are po posting on uh, that are posting on Telegram, that are posting on, say, Instagram, that are posting on Facebook, that are posting on different social media, pretending to be me telling people, hey, invest in this and, uh, you know, throw some money at me and uh, all will be well with you. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they're trying to scam the public. They're trying to scam uh, those people who follow individuals with large social media uh, followings. And so, uh, unfortunately, Elena Danam is a public figure. She has a very large social media following. And her principal sources, Thorhan, uh, Una, Valnek, uh, some of the Commander Ardana, these different extraterrestrials that she's interacted with, people will say that, oh, yeah, I'm in touch with Thorhan. Oh, yeah, I'm in touch with Valnek. Oh, yeah, I'm in touch with... And, and it's just people wanting to make a name for themselves or impersonate them. Uh, just just to generate a social media following. So that's unfortunate, but it, it is happening. So it just means you, you've got to exercise discernment because often what happens is that uh, these extraterrestrials will, will choose one person to be their emissary, to be their contactee. Now, why would they do that? Well, I, th I think it, it is precisely uh, for similar reasons why uh, these individuals are chosen to be contactees in the first place. That, you know, whether we're talking about Elena Denard, whether we're talking about Jean-Charles Moyen or JP or talk Alex Collier or talking about some of the classic contactees, these people all have unique qualities that qualify them to be contacted, uh, to be able to handle the frequencies of the beings they're being contacted with. And this is not something that everyone can do. I mean, and so there are people that, as I mentioned, that are going to be jealous of that, that want to kind of fabricate that. But you, you can't fabricate your frequency. If, if you aren't able to handle extraterrestrial frequencies, then uh, you just need to go through a preparation process, a learning process, and that's not something that's going to be very easy to do in, in a world like ours where there 
are a lot of risks to being a extraterrestrial contactee. I mean, you, you look at what happened to Alex Collier. I mean, he was uh, he had a family, uh, he had a career, and when he went public, all of that was risked and all of that was lost because he went public. Uh, Elena Denan, because she was a professional archaeologist and when she realised that Egyptian antiquities were being scammed or stolen by the Freemasons, she spoke out against that and, and, and that led to her losing her career. When, when I found out that ex, extraterrestrials were really visiting us, that there was a cover-up, that there were agreements, and I spoke out about it, that led to me losing my career. So people who are willing to sacrifice their careers and their livelihood and their families uh, because of their beliefs, you know, these are not things that anyone can just do. So this is why uh, contactees like Elena Denan, Alex Colley and so forth should be honoured because they went through great sacrifice to get to where they are. Whereas people who impersonate and hoax them and say, oh, yeah, I'm in touch with, you know, Thorhan or Valnek, you know, what did they sacrifice? It's just for them, it's just like a way of getting a big social media following. Okay, so let's uh, go on to this story. Okay, this is the Nordic Extraterrestrial Assimilation Program. This is uh, JP's latest update. We're up to update number 29 now. Wow, it's amazing how how quickly things fly. I mean, that means I'll be doing a book three, a volume three. I would never have thought I'd be writing a, a, one book, let alone three books about JP uh, when I first met him and talked to him. Uh, but, you know, there's been an evolution and now he's, now he's enlisted in the army and he's giving me data and he's starting to hand over, he's starting to send me more and more photos and some videos. So we will be putting those, making those available uh, soon. So here he went on a mission where he talked about uh, he and three other soldiers accompanied these four extraterrestrials to a facility at a military base. And they went into that facility uh, wearing, you know, with long hair and with the typical Nordic, very pale features and the Nordic uh, outfits. They went in there and they came out physically transformed. You know, they had like what appeared to be normal civilian clothing. Their hair was cut short. Uh, their pale demeanour was gone. Now they looked tanned. And so essentially they looked like they could fit into any anyone uh, into any society and so this is part of an assimilation program and so the four of them were then transported to the airport where they would be going to different locations so immediately when jp told me this i remembered howard menger from the 1950s talking about the same thing and there are other contactees that talked about similar things where they would actually help assimilate the human-looking Nordics that they had come into contact with, and they would help to simulate them on, on an ad hoc basis. So they would cut their hair, give them clothing, give them money, give them false ID kits, uh, whereas now this is an official program. So these Nordics just arrive on Earth. It's kind of like in the Men in Black. Uh, so JP is performing roles like in the Men in Black. So he... Newly arrived Nordics. Oh, where do you come from? Oh, I come from uh, Alpha Centauri, Proxima B, and oh, uh, weather up there is fantastic. You know, minus ten degrees in the in the sun. Fantastic weather. Here we are on Earth, or whatever. So they're here. They've newly arrived, and it's like they look like off-world beings. Like, okay, look, we, we first got to look after that that pale demeanor. Or, you know, that won't do. Here, you have to fit in. So we, we're going to give you a tan going to cut that hair, you need to have the clothing, you need to have ID, so here's an ID, okay, here's, here's your Florida driving licence and here's your uh, US passport so you can go <laughs> wherever you want to go now, uh, pretend to be a, a Floridian uh, rather than an Alpha Centaurian and off you go. So that, there's an official assimilation program just like it in the Men in Black program, it's just like you get your arrivals, they go into these facilities and they get assimilated and JP's uh, performing the role 
of like the men in black. Okay, you take them to the facility. Uh, they, they look like a Nordic. You take them in, they come out, wow, look at you. You look like a Floridian. Yeah, yeah. And it's like they they have uh, all of the clothing and uh, taught whatever they need to uh, be taught. Uh, that, that was one of the other things uh, that I remember Howard Menger talked about in the 50s, that he would teach them colloquial English. So he, because the thing to remember about the Nordics is that these are very smart. You know, they have eidetic memories. Okay, so, you know, they have photographic memories. So if you tell them, okay, um, you know, you, you say, uh, you say Caribbean. No, 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 that's, that's the, uh, uh, that's the American way of saying it. You've got to say it like an Australian, Car Caribbean, the Caribbean, right? <laughs> say it like that. So they pick it up straight away. So they, they learn the colloquialism. So Held Menger talked about how he would teach the Nordics to speak with, say, a, uh, a colloquial English, uh, North American colloquial English. And so the same thing happened. JP said that these guys went in there, they came out, and they were speaking, uh, they were speaking differently, like a normal person. So, so yeah, and they can. Uh, this is this is uh, this just kind of tells you a lot about how bright these beings are. That they could like just in the matter of a few hours uh, learn colloquial English. Uh, so yeah, there you have it. Uh, an official Nordic extraterrestrial assimilation program. Incredible stuff. Okay, so here is something. Okay, so uh, Dan Willis, who has who was one of the uh, 2001 Disclosure Project witnesses, he served uh, in the U.S. Navy and he was involved in an incident involving uh, radar tracking of a USO. That's an underwater, uh, sorry, un under unidentified submersible object USO, and so he was. Uh, he saw some radar trackings or some uh, information about that and spoke about that incident at the 2001 Disclosure Project uh, conference. And he uh, also worked as a professional uh, newsman for uh, many years, and he has done a review of nine psychological operations. So this is something that uh, you can watch on YouTube. Uh, it is really important that we become we get up to speed with these psychological operations and what how they are, they are conducted because i think what we are going to be experiencing as 2024 plays out is more and more psychological operations i mean misinformation i mean if for those of you that paid attention uh, to commentators describing uh, the World Economic Forum. What did they say the biggest threat uh, to humanity was? Was was it global change? Was it the Russians, the bad, bad, mean Russians about to invade uh, Europe? No, it's misinformation. Yes, the greatest threat to world peace is misinformation. So if you follow... Uh, those news sources, news sites that put out misinformation, you are a threat, the biggest threat to society. So this is where we're going as a global civilization. More and more emphasis is going to be on identifying genuine information from misinformation or disinformation. So Dan Willis has done a, uh, a short video about uh, disinformation and I'm going to be interviewing Dan uh, in the next week, uh, next week, and we're going to be going deeper into this topic. But one of the things that came up uh, in this was a um, photo of the Valnek that <clears throat> that Elena Denan, excuse me. that um, Valnek is one of the contactees that, or one of the ET contacts that Elena Denam has uh, met. Uh, he was part of the team that rescued her when she was uh, nine years old. Now, he was actually photographed in a Skype meeting that she was having with 
Danny Henderson. So Danny Henderson and Elena Denan were having a Skype meeting. And Elena says, well, I, I can see Valneck behind you. And so here you have uh, the image of Valneck behind Danny Henderson. And Danny also has had an interaction with Valneck. And so we discussed it in our first interview back in, uh, what was it, January of 2022, I think we, I had my first interview with um, Danny Henderson. So she discussed it. Now, here you actually have a clear image of a being. Now, that being, if you look at that face and compare that to the face over here, it is the same being. It is Valneck. It, this is the being who rescued Elena when she was like nine years old, along with Thorhan and, and I think it was a third, a female um, member of the Galactic Federation, Mina, Mira, I think it was, was her name. But Valnek, you look at his face, look at that prominent chin, right? Well, here you've got this being with a prominent chin, prominent uh, nose. It, it is the same being. So people say, well, you know, where's the photographic evidence supporting anything that Elena Danan says? I mean, it's just stories, right? It's just stories. Well, here's a photo. Here you have uh, another witness, uh, Danny Henderson, who is a corroborating witness, says, yeah, I've seen, I've met with or seen Valnek. And here you have a photo through Skype, uh, uh, a still shot, or a Skype recording, and here you have the image of Valnek. Okay, so what that proves is that Elena Danan is having or has had contacts with Valnek. And so when people say, come along and say, well, uh, you know, I'm having contacts with Valnek, then you have to be skeptical about that uh, because the thing is, that according to the information that Elena has gotten, Valnek is not in communication with anyone. He, ha he has been reassigned to another solar system and he is not in communication with anyone else. And why would Elena Danan, uh, why, would, why would we believe Elena Danan over others? Well, here you have two sources. You have Danny Henderson saying, yeah, I've seen Valnek. And here you have a photo of Valnek um, during a conversation between Elena and Danny, some very compelling stuff. Okay, so that really brings an end uh, to the week in review for February 3rd. Don't forget, uh, later today, a few hours time, there will be my first webinar for 2024. It's going to be uh, uh, really important because things are going to be going down. There's going to be some major things you can expect. I think this is going to be the year there's going to be a, a lot of confusion, a lot of anxiety, a lot of events are going to play out. Um, it's going to be scary. There's going to be kind of um, a, a lot of, let's just say, false flag operations, a lot of uh, contrived terrorist attacks with some genuine terrorist attacks. And, of course, uh, you're going to have more and more ships, UFOs, motherships, arcs, all appearing. I think this is all by all all by design that the powers that be that are holding on do not want us to progress into becoming an intergalactic civilization, uh, which would happen immediately if the 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 motherships appeared and the space arcs appeared and the different extraterrestrial civilizations openly started interacting with us, we'd very quickly be propelled into a galactic civilization. But the deep state, the powers that be don't want that, so they're creating all this confusion. So well, I think we're going to witness everything happening uh, as 2024 plays out. There's going to be a lot of really good stuff happening, and there's going to be a lot of really bad stuff happening. And we have to decide where we're going to place our attention and it's it's very very important that you decide where you place your attention are you going to place your attention on uplifting transformative stories things that give you hope and optimism for the future because where your beliefs go reality flows 
And similarly, if you focus on the negative and get really dragged down by all the negative things happen happening around you, again, where your where where your attention goes, reality flows. You know, your your attention, your beliefs are gonna manifest your reality. So that doesn't mean you've got to be blind to negative things happening. It doesn't mean that you have to be kind of like just a total uh, let's just say a person that is, you know, that will only follow good the good news and nothing else. You've got to find a balance, but understand that you know where your attention goes, reality flows. Be aware of all the negative stuff, but put your attention on the positive, transformative, uplifting material. That will be the reality that not only manifests around you that you will flow into and you don't want to do the other thing of just manifesting a negative reality for yourself so for those that want to kind of learn more about that this is the opportunity uh, do my webinar today at 2 p.m eastern standard time so thank you for joining and being a part of the exopolitics today week in review you have been listening to exopolitics today with dr michael sala Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.